I bring you the warm migrant and diaspora greetings from the Republic of the Gambia and the United Kingdom of Great Britain. As the business and practices of remittance sending improves, such as to improve impact on sustainable development, stakeholders need to be alert and responsive to emerging issues and trends so as to prevent unintended consequences, mitigate emergent challenges and constraints, capitalize on new opportunities and options, and maintain onward progression. To policymakers in the room, regulators in sending and receiving countries, money service businesses, international development institutions, and remittance senders and receivers themselves, I bring to your kind attention three challenges and two opportunities that I think require appropriate consideration and timely remedial and stimulating actions. Number one, digital dominance and social exclusion of irregular and low-income migrants. Irregular migrants, like other people affected by socioeconomic deprivation, are victims of technological divide and digital exclusion. As digital dominance increases, marginalization intensifies, meaning access to remittance and other digital resources becomes more restricted to this small but important class of people. Secondly, on the same point, in the Global Forum for Migration and Development for 2020 under the chair of the United Arab Emirates, I had the good fortune to lead the work on leveraging technology to empower migrants. And I highlighted the phenomenon I described as algorithmic bias in the digitization, in the world of digitization and artificial intelligence. This disproportionately affects people of African descent who also make up a significant part of the migrant population. The power of digitization makes it easy for single-handed, almost single-handed surveillance and control. This may be a malevolent government or a maniacal techno uh, technopreneur or even a spotty teenager, but the power of single-handed control need to be tempered so as not to disrupt the activities of the multitudes of individual migrants and diaspora who use digital remittance services. Second, the hostile migrant policies and practices and its impact on income status of senders. In this era of sustainable development goals and the global compact on migration, some of us have naively assumed that a human rights approach to migration is a done deal. Of course, we are to know that reversals of gains and actual retrogression abounds in this world. I have lived all my adult life in the United Kingdom, a good and progressive country, yet as we speak, we are debating a bill in Parliament, and the title of the bill, to our utmost shame, is Illegal Migration Bill. But this alerts us again that the wins that we have cannot be taken for granted, and this hostile environment for migrants seeks to pauperize people and in fact, brutally make the lives and livelihoods of irregular migrants brutally miserable so that migration is not a viable option for them. 
this overall reduces the income of migrants, thereby affecting remittances. Number three, the changing dynamics among older, younger, and multi-generational diaspora. Some of these have been referred to yesterday, referred to yesterday. The older remitters, their remittances go down and eventually stop as they no longer have parents to look after at home and their obligations diminish. The younger migrants still have obligations, but faced with the cost of living crisis and other challenges, the ways that they remit would change. And of course, for the multi-generational diaspora, they may not even be under an obligation to remit, to remit money. Therefore, incentives and programs for formal financial engagement with countries of origin and countries of heritage need to be a permanent feature. Number four, this is now an opportunity. A remittance substitution by senders and its effect on countries, on, uh, in receiving countries. Through the programs that we promote, including things that I work on myself, we encourage the migrants to invest in countries of origin, thereby contributing not only to local multiplier effect and sectoral development, but in so doing, they also earn local currency to pay for their expenses and their obligations. This is what I describe as a remittance substitution. And we need to ask in the medium and long term what effect would it have on foreign exchange flows and how can unintended consequences be moderated and mitigated? Number five, and this is the final point, it's also an opportunity, that is increases in former remittances and it uh, creates opportunities for securitization and leveraging. We have been speaking for about a decade now about future flow securitization, but there has been very little action, apart from few case studies in Africa with Afrexim Bank. The absolute reality that hundreds of millions will come into a country in foreign currency year in, year out, can be securitized and leveraged for a greater purpose. And one area that's almost totally underdeveloped is how that is used to improve the sovereign credit rating of especially the LDCs in Africa. This is particularly important because a better sovereign credit rating reduces the cost of um, borrowing significantly. Finally, as I conclude, I have come to observe that philosophically, the life of a progressive is a life of unhappiness. This also seems to apply to the life of development practitioners. For when we succeed in our advocacy programs and projects on remittances and investment, we are quick to want more. For, the, for indeed the success we see, the success we achieve, make or see that greater public good can be achieved. Development itself is not a steady upward curve or trajectory. It is bedeviled with peaks and troughs, ups and downs. Therefore, the vigilance that we propose on remittances and remittance actions is not symptomatic of paranoia or cynicism. It is a veritable virtue in the practice of continuous development. I thank you all and look forward for the interactive sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gribril, for, for those remarks. And I cannot help myself. You just mentioned something about securitization. Uh, my first project was securitization that we did uh, when I was in another life at the Inter-American Development Bank uh, with uh, Banco do Brasil. And they first looked at that, and it worked. And what I wanted to say by, the, uh, say by this is this has been lost in, you know, in, in the tracks, uh, this experience was 23 years ago. It works, it still works. But for some reason, 
we forget that. So thank you for, for raising this because this was very innovative at the time and in 2023 remains very innovative. So we, we should revisit also what, what the lessons that have been taught o over the years. But without further ado, allow me to bring Patty to the podium and we will, yes, Patty, please. Good morning. I stand on all protocols observed, um, and I think I will follow from the inspiration of Professor Jibril and, send, and bring you greetings from Zambia, which is my passport country, and Kosovo, where I reside, and the global space where the, the, global, space where the global research forum on diaspora and transnationalism operates from. I'm delighted to be here today among experts, practitioners, private sector players, United Nations system development partners, diaspora organizations, migrant organizations, diaspora actors, migrant actors. It's been inspirational, thought provoking, and a humbling day one of the conference. Now I was asked to deliver some remarks where I should really focus on the receiving end. That's the one billion people, families, who are directly impacted by money sent abroad by migrants. Now in particular, I'm going to try and zoom in on speaking a bit more about the main challenges and the needs that these households face when receiving these remittances, looking a bit at the market solutions and the actions of governments and countries of origin, as well as other stakeholders in terms of facilitating the access and use of remittances. So indulge with me for a little bit. Put yourself in the shoes of the one billion families. Think of your family member having sent you in their remitting currency. If they were in Kenya, think about 15,000 shillings, 2,000 South African rand, 1,500 Botswana pula, 800 Chinese yuan, which is better understood in other currencies as 100 euros or $108, for instance. I think this is today's exchange rate. But regardless of this currency or the immigration status of your family member sending this money, there are two goals. That you, the recipient, gets the maximum value in the home country and that the money is spent wisely and strategically, principally, as we have heard yesterday, on consumption needs that are critical for life, for life saving or rather life saving SDGs, such as food, shelter health, education, and if some leftover, some investment is taking place in a small business that sustains the family SDGs. That's the discussion taking that has taken place in the two tracks. However, the reality is that the chances are that the maximum value is not received by you or your family. And the most value, the most value that probably would be received, uh, the highest value rather that would be received is probably that one that would come in an envelope, cash held, because you would have $100 handheld, but filled with all sorts of costs related to informality based on somebody that's bringing it to you because they trust your family member and probably a very long wait. Or your family member could remit this money through a box, a screen, a booth, or a bank. But remember, terms and conditions apply, KYC. And the costs will vary with these more formal channels provided by service providers. I think we've had a chance uh, to visit some of these service providers and also to hear from them on this platform. So indeed, a challenge for the recipient is the amount that, that is being received is shortchanged due to the high costs from the players in the industry. And so yes, you're receiving less as a family member from, compared to what has been sent. And this is, the reality is that we need to better understand the costs and the profits that the industry is making. And this sits within this global and the individual discussions that we have had in these days on how more money is needed in the pockets of migrant families and for, for the personal SDGs. And if possible for us to increase the reserves that they would have for investment. But how do we embrace the need for private sector to make profit, to continue to service the market so that your family member can send these money safely? From what we heard yesterday, how do we remove, if you like, the demonization of profit? Because it is business. So how do we shift the cost discussion? 
And as we do this, let's weigh where the benefits should fall in the context of the SDG agenda. For high costs means less money in the pockets of families to address these critical financial gaps and to cushion uh, available resources. So it's no wonder that the market solutions that have been provided by governments working in the regulatory space focus on reducing costs. It's an easy target, isn't it? But it's not easy to manage with so many players in the industry rigid for good business, good um, resources to, be, to, to go along, but not so good reason, not so good migrant focused reasons. So this particular explains the focus that we've had on cost reductions even in global frameworks such as the Global Compact on Migration and also some of what we have seen in the case of the EU as we heard yesterday on the costs dropping for particular corridors, though it doesn't tell us why we are not seeing the corresponding increase in resources available in the hands of families. Another aspect I will switch you to is how we receive the money. So the COVID pandemic was called an accelerator for digital solutions yesterday, moving us away from this cash Cash, the, this cash-based payment system and making us more digital. So it put the spotlight on these digital solutions which today are still needed in terms of driving the cost down, providing a variety of options and also being closer, which was important with COVID, with limited mobility to the remitter and the recipients and improved security. So yes, it is a market solution going digital and offering variability, very well welcomed going, going um, mobile. It's been a resource, it was a gift during COVID. It is a gift for many that connects migrants to their families to send money and also to be able to share much more than money. However, we've heard even from Professor Jibril's remarks and we've also seen the statistics and the experiences from migrants that innovation around digital solutions haven't solved all the problems. Hello, KYC, which puts a stronger limitation on remitters who are in an irregular status with families still depending on their remittances. So this presents a challenge for those who have, had, who have not had their status regularized, who remain excluded to access much more than they would to, through these world standard innovative solution. That means a corresponding difficulty to get remittances received in response to the needs and often using insecure, long-weighted, hand-held remittances. So the challenge, another challenge that lies with us is how your family is going to use the remittances. From a very practical perspective, I think we need to open up this thing and look at a bit of an open communication. What is the earning power of your family member? What about the dark side of remittances? And we also need to move it all the way to when it is received, how are these remittances effectively used one family at a time? And the SDG implementation indeed are being cushioned by remittances in terms of better health, better education, but maybe not better quality of education, but also more resources that are meant to channel through different small business investments that go back again into financing personal SDGs, but the separation is also very important. But indeed, we need to know that better progress at home will mean that remittances can go a longer mile with free quality education, healthcare, and agricultural inputs, putting indeed more money in the pockets for other SDGs to be, to be met, given the short time that we have to meet them. Now, in preparing uh, for today, I was drawn to the concept of a silent party. A friend of mine told me that a silent party is where people gather at a party and at the door you are given headsets and a playlist and each of you gets to pick which kind of music you would like to listen to and you proceed to put on your headsets each one having picked the kind of music they would like to listen to but the only difference here is that you are all enjoying the silent company of everyone and you probably don't have a sore throat the next day from the party goers from all the yelling that would take place over loud music and you will see my point in a moment. So I wanna shift your focus to what actions that governments are taking in countries of origin and stakeholders with regard to access and use. And you will understand the silent party in a moment. Now we know how remittances are being tracked and we have heard from central bankers how these private flows of financing are recorded in central bank ledgers, but why should we care? We also know that market players are providing options. We've just heard that. We know that the private sector is also lobbying the regulatory space to reduce the cost. Researchers, think tanks, 
For instance, here on the African continent, you have the African Institute of Remittances that's trying to unpack and understand this. Diaspora organizations, migrant organizations, everybody digging into information on what and how to extend these remittances. But have we clearly understood the behavioral aspects of families and their decisions on spending and investment? How do we support, because support is the word, that their effective good use of these remittances to the very last mile. Some of the things we need to understand, or rather question, is how do we focus a little bit more distinctively on remittances and investment to understand predominantly what we should be doing around these two tracks, even though sometimes they're mixed within the same Western Union, within the same digital sending amount, within the same bank transfer. But essentially, for migrants and their families, they don't call it remittances, they don't call it investment, they just say money to sustain livelihood and SDGs in the daily definitions. So we need to accept that the only thing that we cannot model as they do in behavioral economics is people's behavior. But we could understand a little bit better about how we can provide an enabling environment for this. For countries of origin, it's, it's clearly very important to continue to work around the regulatory space in terms of the de-risking approaches that have often um, linked small remittances to money laundering that have left many, many families behind and shortchanged. For researchers, think tanks, migrant organizations, diaspora organizations, an unpacking and un un understanding that migrant engagement strategies, remittance improvement targeting, policy options, private sector agency, remittance progress measurement, and bilateral cooperation remains also very important to look at this within this aspect, to look at it within this viewpoint from the fact that we cannot change the behavior of remitters and their families. But how does that change this invisible big pot of migrant resources and the flows in the discussions that we're going to have today in remittance tracks? How do we talk about diversification of remittances and investment towards sustainable development? And we have heard also about how do we really look beyond remittances um, and try to scale up more resources for investment because that is what is going to drive the SDG agenda further. We've heard about the range of projects and programs on food security, renewable energy, climate change related programs, but how do we really harness these and learn the lessons that we need to learn? And then together with diaspora organizations and migrant organizations really leading this reform thinking how do we move around our, our focus on good data? We know that migrants and diaspora have known the importance of financial report way before we had World Bank data. We also know that this has not changed a lot, the discussions that we have around this table. But we also know that crisis, as COVID helped us, and I'm wrapping up in a bit, has helped us to realize the full potential of remittances, but at the same time, there are many crises not very far from us in Sudan and how that has impacted on sending money home, closed, excluded, and locked out, physically and digitally. And so, coming back again to the silent party, I think what's important for us is that we don't root ourselves in the own music from our space as private sector players, as development partners, as diaspora organizations or migrant organization, oblivious to the one billion families that are often not invited to the party. So let us come back home again where the money is coming to work with local associations, with mayors, the extent of migrant and diaspora organizations and moving away from these pick and drop development strategies as they are another reminder of how African countries, for instance, have to have a closer look at alternatives to partnerships in this migration and development space. And to end, let's challenge ourselves on behalf of the people, the one billion families, that when we engage in these global frameworks, such as the Global Compact on Migration, through the monitoring mechanisms and the, uh, the various spaces, for instance, such as the Global Forum on Migration and Development, and indeed spaces like this, that we will indeed engage remittances for transformation. Thank you. <laughs>